الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد الحمد لله الذي بتحميده يستفتح كل أمر حكيم وبذكره يتناعم أهل النعيم Praise be to God, in whose praise the beginnings are opened for any matter of wisdom and consequence, and in whose remembrance the people of eternal felicity enjoy infinite comfort. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi alhamd. Alhamd lillahi alladhi ilayhi turfa'u al-aydi bit-tadarru'i. والابتهال والدعاء في الحج والعمرة والعبادات في الشدة والرخاء وفي السراء والضراء Praise be to God to whom the believer's hands are raised in utter humility and supplication and adoration in the hajj and the umrah and all other acts of worship in hardness and in ease in happiness and in distress الحمد لله الذي جعل الكعبة البيت الحرام قياما للناس وشرع أحكام الحج في شهر الحرام وأوضح المحجة وهدى الأنام Praise be to God who established the Kaaba, the sacred house and laid down the ancient foundations of the pilgrimage and the Umrah of the sacred months and who made clear the path of felicity and guided humankind. Wassalawatullahi ala al-mab'uthi rahmatan lil'alameen al-muqaddam al-mu'azzam al-mukarram min anbiya'ihi wa safwati khalqihi wa shamsi awliya'ihi wa qamari asfiya'ihi wa khiyarati khalqihi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rasulillah وعلى آله وأصحابه وإخوانه المرسلين والملائكة المقربين وسلم تسليما. May God's eternal extolments be upon our noble Lord Muhammad, who was sent as a mercy to all the worlds. To him, who among all God's myriads of prophets was granted preeminence and the greatest and most noble stature who was the quintessence and is the quintessence of God's creation, the radiant sun among his awliya, his saints, the luminous moon among the choicest of God's believers, the best of all creation, the best of all created things. And may God's extolments be upon his family, his companions, his brothers among the prophets and messengers of earlier times, and upon the highest angels close to God, and grant them all perfect peace. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. Amma ba'd, as for what follows, may Allah bless you all, bless all of us, bless our families, bless our neighbors, Bless our Ummah on this blessed day in this blessed month. And may we continue to rejoice and celebrate in the days that follow, which are also the days of Eid. It is a Sunnah during these days, after the next 15, the series of the next 15 obligatory prayers to do this takbir that we were doing today. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi alhamd. It's a sunnah to do that aloud and also to do it whether we are praying in groups or whether we are praying alone. Continuity and community are among the most important foundations of successful religion. Religions cannot succeed without that. They have to have a sense of continuity with the past. They have to create a sense of true community among the believers. In Islam, we are blessed with this to a degree that is not matched by any other faith on the face of the earth. And among those things that make the sense of continuity and of continuity so strong 
in our community are the acts of worship that we do. The pilgrimage, the umrah, paying zakat, the fast of Ramadan, the prayers, and so forth. And of these, the one that we are here today to speak about and to celebrate is of course the Hajj, this great monumental event. We are people who live in difficult times and we make lots of mistakes and many things happen in the world community of Muslims that makes up somewhere like a quarter of human beings that indicate the difficulties that we have today, our immaturity, our, our la loss of authority, valid authority and other things. But of all the things that bless us and really hold us together and that give us this deep sense of community and continuity, the most important of those all are our acts of worship. Of all religions today, the only one that entered into the modern age with all of its acts of worship intact is the religion of Islam. This is a, a miraculous thing. Whereas other religions were taken apart and they changed fundamentally, we who went through the greatest test of all in the colonial and post-colonial periods come into the modern age still praying like our Prophet still fasting the way that he fasted, still making the pilgrimage the way that he made it, paying the zakat the way that he told us to do. This is absolutely amazing. And it shows us that this religion, despite the immense difficulty that it faces at the present time, is dynamic and vital and alive. Allah says in the Quran, Azza wa Jal, جَعَلَ اللَّهُ الْكَعْبَةَ الْبَيْتَ الْحَرَامَ قِيَامًا لِلنَّاسِ وَالشَّهْرَ الْحَرَامَ وَالْهَدْيَ وَالْقَلَائِدَ ذَلِكَ لِتَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ This beautiful verse which we'll talk about today is in Surah Al-Ma'idah, the fifth surah, and it's verse 97. A very beautiful and a very special verse. God made the Kaaba, the sacred house, a support for the people. And so too did he make the sacred month. And we can translate it as some tra translators do, the sacred months. The sacrificial animals, the animals that are taken to the pilgrimage to be sacrificed, the greatest of those was always the camel, especially in earlier times, and then cattle, and then sheep were the least of all. Today, of course, it's almost all sheep, but that's because of the demographics of the modern age. In the past, it was mostly camels and then cattle because these would feed thousands and thousands of people. And these days that follow are called the days of tashriq, they are the days of drying meat because one of the things the pilgrims would do was that they would get these distributions of tons of meat and not having refrigeration or freezing, they would dry it in the baking sun of Minna and then they would go home with very large amounts of meat that they could eat for months. So this was a huge benefit. So he says, God made the Kaaba, the sacred house, a support for the people, for the people who have no other support, no king, no ruler, no government. He made it a support for the people. And so too did he make the sacred month, or the sacred months, the sacrificial animals, and the garlands, the garlands being these very simple adornments that the Arabs would put on the sacrificial animals. That is so that you may come to know that God knows whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth and that God has knowledge of all things. An amazing verse. And this verse is calling upon us to do what we want to try to do today in the very short time that we have. And that is to reflect 
on his eternal wisdom in establishing the sacred house, the Kaaba, and the city of Mecca, and the institution of the sacred months, and the Haram, the huge sanctuary that surrounds the Kaaba, and then all of the institutions of pilgrimage and Umrah, especially the sacrificial animals, which are so beneficial to the people, and the garlands that they wear. And in this, we are to know, we are to become confident in our hearts that God has knowledge of all things, of all that is in the heavens, all that is in the earth, and that whatever He has ordained for us, even though it may not be as tangible, it may not be as uh, momentous as the Hajj, that all of these have supreme wisdom, and in the end they bring out great good for human beings. So God made the Kaaba and He made the Haram. The Prophet said, Inna Allah Ta'ala harrama Makkata yawma khalaqa samawati wal ard. That God established the sanctity of Mecca on the day that He created the heavens and the earth. And for thousands of years, Arabia was always regarded as holy land. The ancient Babylonians, the ancient Sumerians who were before them, and Mesopotamia, the ancient Egyptians looked upon Arabia as a divine land, as a sacred land. And all of them had prehistoric roots that went back to Arabia. In the case of the Babylonians and the Sumerians before them, who in some cases exist a thousand years, a thousand five hundred years before Abraham, before Abraham will re rebuild the Kaaba and restore Mecca. They don't know where it is, but they regard it to, believe, to be the burial place of their father in the flood, whom they called Utupishtim, and whom we call Nuh, Noah. And therefore the Babylonians would take their dead, they would give them a first burial in Iraq, and then they would take them into the Arabian Peninsula, and they would bury them a second time. Especially in Bahrain and in Bahran in Eastern Arabia, because they believed that this was the burial ground of Noah, and we also believe that. It's a general Islamic belief that Noah is buried in Mecca. And they believe that if they could bury their dead in the land where Utupishtim, Noah, was buried, that then their dead might have eternal life, and they might have forgiveness, and they might have paradise like Noah himself had that. So the peninsula was a great thing. It's a momentous thing. And then Abraham, when he uh, is sent as a prophet, which is about 2,000 years before Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, then he restores the Kaaba that had been destroyed. And he also shows us where is the city. And he establishes the sacred house. And then he establishes it, and he establishes around it the haram, the Haram is the sanctuary. Always in Hajj and in Umrah, we have to go into the sanctuary and we have to come out of it. And how big is that sanctuary? 700 square kilometers. Almost 350 square miles. It begins just after, if, if you go today on the highway, you come to a place called Shumaisi. This is where there's a big uh, inspection station, and then you go up on a hill, and then you're in the Haram. All the way from there to um, Arafat, which is about 35 miles, all of that is Haram. And then about 12 and a half miles on the north and the south. So Abraham establishes that. You cannot hunt there, you cannot kill wild animals, you cannot cut the trees. There are certain plants, like the idhir, 
which is a very special plant that grows almost nowhere else and has a very aromatic and medicinal use that the pilgrims were allowed and the people of Mecca were allowed to use. Other things, no. And we'll talk about why they were allowed to use the Idhir. So Abraham creates this place and Allah puts his Haiba, he puts his Mahaba, he puts uh, this great sense of awe upon this stone house and upon the people around it, and upon the sanctuary that's around it. And he protects it from tyrants, and from kings, and from invaders, and from armies. And then, as we will see, and as this verse tells us, for about 2,600 years, the house, the Kaaba, and everything associated with it, especially the Hajj and the Umrah, they become the life of the Arabs. They become the identity of the Arabs. And he makes this great place Ma'alim al-Tawheed. He makes this the great outward symbol of the oneness of God and the belief in the oneness of God. And usually when we talk about the seerah of the Prophet we focus on the degradation and the change which had taken place by the time that the Prophet ﷺ was born. But one of the things that we should not forget is that the Arabs as a people, of all the children of Abraham, they were the most faithful in preserving the teaching of Abraham, the absolute oneness of God, the pilgrimage and the Umrah for thousands of years. Whereas the other lines of the children of Abraham, the children of Isaac, the cha children of Jacob, they did not have that, that same fidelity. And this also has to do with the environment, but it also has to do with the Kaaba, the sacred house. This great ma'alam of Tawheed, this great sign of the eternal oneness of God and of the pilgrimage. And uh, again, around it, the huge haram, 435, almost 450 square miles, a huge area where everything that comes in there is safe. And uh, may it always be that way. May it be that way today and may it be that way tomorrow in this very difficult time that we live in today. But in the one in the 2,600 years before the Prophet وسلم, all of the indications that we have are very clear that whatever the Arabs did, no matter how much strife and civil war they had, that by and large they totally respected the sanctity of the Kaaba. This was their identity. This was their culture. This was their reality. This was their support as a people. And so therefore this had a huge effect on them. Our commentators say that one of the reasons why God forbade that we kill animals or hunt or that we destroy the natural vegetation of the great haram, the great sanctuary around Mecca, is because of the fact that that affirms the sanctity of human life. That whoever goes into that haram is safe. No one can approach them. No one can touch them. And this is something that the Arabs held to with great consistency for 2,600 years. Qatada, who is one of the great successors of the Prophet ﷺ, he said in Jahiliya, in the ages of ignorance, anyone who took refuge in the haram, anyone who comes into that protected area, that huge protected area, was given protection. It didn't matter what they had done, and it did not matter what had been done to them. Anyone who came in that was safe. No one would talk to them in a, in a uh, provocative way. No one would approach them, and they were treated just like other human beings. So this was a great thing. In this verse, Allah says that He made the Kaaba, the sacred house, 
Qiyaman linnas. He made it as a support for the people. And here the word Qiyam, which is a mustar in Arabic, it is a verbal noun. This is very emphatic. So he could have said that he made it qa'ima, something that supports them. But he said a supporting, an, an act of supporting. And in fact, this word qiyam, it is also a personification. Because we use that word, which means qiwam or qayyim, we use it for a king or for a family leader or a tribal leader who takes care of you who protects you from harm and who gives you good. And if we look at the earliest tafsirs, we will see Qatada and Ibn Zayd and others, they will say that all the other people of the world had kings. And these kings were there to protect them from civil war. The kings were there to do justice, whether they did that or not. But they were there to protect the people from fighting each other. That was one of the main obligations of kingship. If you cannot preserve the security of your people, then you don't rule. So they said all the other people, the Byzantines, the Romans, the Greeks, the Persians, they had kings and leaders, but the Arabs had none. No king, no leader, no ruler, no government. In a very huge environment, in the Arabian Peninsula, which is almost a continent, it is so big. Protected from the outside. No natural harbors. A coral sea on the west, the Red Sea, with no natural harbors. The harbors that are there today have been built by modern technology. And the Arabian Gulf to the east is very shallow, very sandy. You have pearls there, you have coral in the other. No rivers in Arabia. It's an amazing place, strategically located in the center of the world, Asia, Africa, and Europe. This is also part of what we reflect on when we look at this verse, so that you know that God has knowledge of everything in the heavens and the earth. So it was the nature of this peninsula that it would protect the people there. Protect them from what? From the outside. Almost impossible for the Persians or the Greeks, Alexander the Great, even though he attempted to do that. Almost impossible for them to come into Arabia. But what about the inside? Because in the inside, where you have tribes that become more and more numerous with the passing of generations, that as these tribes develop, then also with them come strife warfare, feuds. So they had to have some support within. And so they say that this is what the Kaaba was. The Kaaba, the sacred house, the Haram, the sacred months, the Hedi, the sacrificial animals and the garlands, that these then become like the king of the Arabs. They are the identity of the pre-Islamic Arabs. They are the protection of the pre-Islamic Arabs. And although there was strife, and there was feuding, and although there were dangers, there was always a silver lining. And that silver lining was one of peace for one-third of the year. For one-third of the year. And in fact, there could be other times when people, families, and traders were also safe. So then he talks about the sacred month, al-Shahr al-Haram. Some commentators say that this is a reference to the month that we are in right now, which is the greatest of the sacred months, the 12th lunar month, dhul hijjah the month of Hajj. And of course, these first 10 days, which we now finish today, these are among the most beloved of all days to God. They are among the greatest of all days to God, like Ramadan. We have the great month of Ramadan and we finished with Eid. And we have the great 10 days of Dhul Hijjah in which we strive to do good and to fast and to pray and to do dhikr. And then we have the Eid again. So these are two blessed seasons. And the sacred months are four. One third of the year. Three of them are called the months of the Hajj. And those are the 11th, 12th, and 1st lunar months. Dhul Qa'dah, 
Dhul Hijjah and then Muharram. And then you have Rajab, which is the seventh month and that comes in the middle of the year. And that is called the month of Umrah. It was there for Umrah. And during this time, the people were safe. Again, Qatada and Ibn Zayd and other early commentators, they stress that. They say that in the pre-Islamic period, for thousands of years, a man might encounter during the sacred months the person who killed his father, or killed his brother, or killed his cousin, because they were plagued by the feuds. They were plagued by this thing. And yet, he would not approach him. He would not speak to him. He would not come near him, because it was a sacred month. And their families were safe. Their tribes, their tribes were safe. Not just because they were maybe going to Hajj, but because it was a sacred month. So this meant for three, for one third of the year, <clears throat> there was trade, there was free movement, there was the ability to make peace. And this is one of the traditions of the Arabs. This is one of the things that made Quraysh the lords of the Arabs, because they were the ones who received the delegations who were coming to Mecca with great honor. But also they were the ones who went out. They were merchants. They had the journey of the winter and the summer, as you know, going down to the Yemen, then going up to the north in the summer to Syria. They were called at tujar but they were also called the people of God. And, the, and they knew all the tribes. They were related to all the tribes through intermarriage because the tribes come to Mecca and they get to know each other. They give their sons and daughters in marriage and so forth. This was an incredible institution. This was an incredible institution. So for the people who had no support, who had no king, who had no government, it is the Kaaba that is that and the haram that is around it, and the sacred rites of pilgrimage. And then Allah talks about the hadi. Of course, the hadi, the sacrificial animals, the camels, the cattle, the sheep, you know, these are a benefit to the people who sell them. They raise them and they sell them to the pilgrims. But also they are an immense benefit to the people who receive that meat and who dry it and then who, who use it for months to come. But also it was the custom that the Hadi would protect you. So that if you were going to Mecca, even outside the sacred months, and you had the sacrificial animal, and the animal had the garlands on it, then no one would approach you. No one would touch you. You and your party would be safe. So this meant that in one third of the year, it doesn't matter what you do or where you're going. You are safe. And there can be peace and peacemaking. But then even in all other times, if you want to go to Mecca, then you take the Hadi and no one will block you. And the reference, reference to the garlands here, the garlands are the ornamentations that they put on their animals. This ornamentation was really simple. Sometimes it's just sandals that they put over the back of the animal. But the sandals were enough to show that this animal has been designated for sacrifice. And in other times it was garlands made from the bark of trees or from certain plants like the idkha. And again, the people would not approach with the intention to do harm those who had the hadi or those who had these garlands. And the garland worked the other way as well. Because the custom in pre-Islamic Arabia was that after you went to Mecca, especially if you are coming out at a time when the sacred months will be finished, then you put garlands on yourself and on your animal. Usually from the idkhir, from the special aromatic medicinal plant that's in Mecca. Because they were allowed to get that plant. And this is one of the reasons why. They would put it on their rooftops and so forth. But this meant that they are coming from Mecca. So no matter where they were going, again, they would be given free passage. Because they have come from Mecca, they are going back home, and they will be protected in that. 
So these are amazing signs. And Allah is asking us to reflect on that. Barakallahu lana wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Azim wa nafa'ana wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikri al-Hakim. Innahu ta'ala jawadun, kareemun, malikun, barrun, raoofun, rahimun, wa rabbun haleem. May God bless us and bless all of you through the glorious Qur'an, the beautiful Qur'an. May he enable us to understand this book, this incredibly beautiful and profound book, this subtle book, this elegant book. May God benefit us and all of you by his signs in the book and in creation and in ourselves, by the wise remembrance. In truth, God, exalted be he, is generous and kind, a just king. He fulfills his promises. He is compassionate and merciful. He is an all-forbearing Lord. Astaghfirullah. Uh, ask God's forgiveness, ask for me forgiveness for ourselves. May Allah accept from us. Istaghfirullah. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, La ilaha illa Allah, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Walillahi alhamd. Alhamdulillahi al awwali fil azal, Qabla khalqi al mukawanati wal makan, Min ghayri awwalin wala bidaya. الحمد لله الآخر في الأبد بعد فناء المكونات والأزمان بغير آخر ولا نهاية. Praise be to God, the first in pre-existence before creation and all existent things, before the existence of time and place, without a first time, without a beginning. Praise be to God, the last in eternal everlastingness after the obliteration of existent things and former times, without a final time or an end. Alhamdulillah al-zahidi fi uluwihi bi qahrihi min ghayri bu'd wal batini fi dunuwihi bi qurbihi min duni mas. Praise be to God, who is manifest in His Highness by virtue of his all-compelling power, without being physically far away, who is hidden in his closeness by virtue of his nearness, without physical contact. God is not in us, he is not outside of us. He is not touching us, he is not not touching us. He is not physically close, he is not physically far away. He is the Lord of space and time. He is not in space and time. He is the first and the last, unlike anything in creation. No analogies work with him. Alhamdulillah, alladhi ahsana bi lutfihi kulli shay'in bada'ahu wa atqana sun'a kulli shay'in ansha'ahu. Praise be to God who in his subtle kindness made beautifully everything which he originated and who made perfectly everything that he brought into existence. وصلى الله على سيد الأولين والآخرين رسوله المفضل بالشفاعة الكبرى والحوض المورود والمخصوص بالوسيلة والمقام المحمود وعلى أصحابه المهاجرين والأنصار وأهل بيته الأخيار وإخوانه السالفين في الأزمان والتابعين له ولهم بإحسان تسليما كثيرا May God extol the noble Lord, the Sayyid of the first and last generations, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the Chosen One, his messenger who was given special favor by virtue of the major intercession that he has on the Day of Judgment, and the watering pool to which his believing followers come and after which they will never thirst again on the Day of Judgment. 
who has been given special distinction by having the wasila, direct means of access to God's pleasure, and the most praiseworthy station before him, and upon his companions, the immigrants, the muhajireen, and the helpers, the ansar, and the beautiful people of his house, his brothers among the prophets and the believers of all times, and of earlier times, and those who follow him in sincerity and grant them abundant peace. Ameen. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Walillahi alhamd. So we come back to this verse. Inshallah, we will conclude by looking at it a little bit further. جَعَلَ اللَّهُ الْكَعْبَةَ الْبَيْتَ الْحَرَامَ قِيَامًا لِلنَّاسِ وَالشَّهْرَ الْحَرَامَ وَالْهَدْيَ وَالْقَلَائِدَ ذَلِكَ لِتَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٌ God made the Kaaba, the sacred house, a support or a king supporting the people. And so too did he make the sacred months the sacrificial animals and the garlands. Now you understand more exactly what that means. It's an amazing reference. That is so that you may come to know that God knows whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth and that God has knowledge of everything. So this verse calls upon us then to see the great depth, the wisdom, in fact the incredible wisdom of God in his creation of the Arabian Peninsula, the place he put it, the creation of Mecca and the Kaaba, the sanctuary, all of these things that we've talked about. We have to remember that when God restored Mecca with Abraham and Ishmael, what was it? It was just a valley in the mountains, in the wilderness of Faran, or what the Bible calls Paran, it can't hardly support life. And there Abraham and Ishmael, when Ishmael becomes of age, they build this stone house. And to the people, this is just the masjid of Ibrahim. This is just the mosque of Abraham. And then in that village, there's no one there. It's just three people, Hajar, Ismail, Abraham, who comes and goes. And then Ismail marries the woman from Jurham and they begin to have children. But this takes generations. Yet at the same time, God tells Abraham to make his house a haram and to make the land around it a sanctuary. 350 square miles. And then to announce the pilgrimage and to call all the believers in the oneness of God to come to the pilgrimage. And then they begin to come, generation after generation after generation. Who would have ever imagined? And by the time that the children of Ishmael become thousands and hundreds of thousands, then this institution is there to support them and to support all the other people attached to them and to protect them. And had it not been for this, nothing would have ever come from them. They would have never been safe. Arabia would have been too dangerous to live in. Culture and civilization could not have grown there. When we look at the Arabic language, which was created for the Qur'an, the Arabic language is the most ancient of all the Semitic tongues, of all the Hamitic tongues. It's much more ancient than Hebrew. It's much more ancient than Syriac or Aramaic, the language of Jesus or of Moses. And we know this through scientific study of comparative linguistics. How could Arabic be preserved like this? Of course, the environment, environment always does that. But that environment was also one which could destroy the language and destroy its people. So the other factor, which is much more important, that Allah established the Kaaba, He established the sanctuary, the sacred house. He established the sacred months and the institutions of pilgrimage. And this gave the Arabs identity, linguistic unity. 
They have dialects, but they all understand each other. For thousands of years, the way that Arabic was spoken in the days of the Prophet wasallam, based on comparative Semitic linguistics, is at least the way that Arabic was spoken 10,000 years ago. In the New Stone Age. This is scientific. An amazing language. And again, it's the peninsula itself which keeps people on the outside from coming in, although it's strategically located. But then inside the peninsula, you have the Kaaba and you have the rites of pilgrimage and these keep the people together and although they war with each other they fight with each other they have their feuds but for one third of every year there is peace and peacemaking and there is trade and they flourish and they respected that and god insisted that they inspect that that they respect that so this is a remarkable thing and in this god is able to create there in the Arabian Peninsula, among the ancient pure Arabs, the Qahtanis, and among the Abrahamic Arabs, al arabul Musta'ribah, the Arabized Arabs, the sons and daughters of Ishmael, a great people, an amazing people, a people who've never been ruled by a king, never been ruled by a tyrant, who've never had a government. They have a very basic way of life, but they have a great culture. And they have a one religion, and they have a religious identity. They have an amazing culture. This is amazing, and it's all decentralized. And this is because of that amazing miracle of the sacred house. So we have to reflect on that. And today, this is of course the Qibla. This is the direction to which we all turn to pray at this moment. And one quarter of humanity all over the world. What an amazing thing. And the miracles of the pilgrimage and of the sacred house, these continue into all times. And here in the United States, we have the great life example of Al Hajj Malik al Shabazz, of Malcolm X, may Allah have mercy upon him, who when he goes to the pilgrimage, not only is he transformed, but then he comes back to transform in turn. And how many thousands of Americans, including myself, come into this deen because of the blessing of Malcolm, had, of Malcolm X, and in my case, because of the pilgrimage. I read the whole autobiography of Malcolm X all night. I couldn't put it down. It's in January 2nd, 1970. But when I finished the chapter on Hajj, then I had to stop and think. And alhamdulillah, Allah brought me right into the deen at that moment. No hesitation, because of the blessing of Malcolm X, Al-Hajj Malik al-Shabbat, who gets that blessing from the pilgrimage. So this is an amazing event. May Allah enable us to reflect on these things. And may Allah enable us to understand the treasures that we have. We are today a very young people. Most Muslims in the world are under 18 years of age. This is one of our problems. Because as the Arabs say, الشَّبَابُ شُعْبَةٌ مِنَ الْجُنُونَ That youthfulness is one of the types of insanity. <laughs> so we do things that are often extremely unwise and wrong. But nevertheless, this ummah is where the good is. This is the last bus home. This is the living, dynamic, vital prophetic religion. May Allah enable us to bring it to life in ourselves, among our neighbors, in the society, and in the world at large. May Allah bless these days. May Allah enable us to uh, enjoy them. And Allah has told us this in the Quran so that what? He has shown us all the benefits that come from Hajj. That it protects from dangers, it brings good, you know, there's the meat of the sacrificial animals, all these things. These are all tangible benefits. But he tells you that so that you may know that he knows all that is in the heavens. The heavens in the Quran is always the great realm. Heavenly realities dominate earthly realities. That is the realm of the archetypes. That is the realm of the angels. That is the angelic realm. That is the realm of destiny and of good. 
and there's no access of evil to it. So God knows all the ideals. He knows all the meanings of the heavens. But he also knows everything in the earth, meaning our passions, our ignorance, our troubles, our warfare, our strife, and other things. He knows all of these things. And in ordaining the Hajj, the sacred house and the sanctuary, this is reflected. And so therefore we're also called on to know that when he commands us to eat what is halal and to leave what is haram, to live a good life, to be modest, to be upright, to be just, to be merciful, that all of this is wisdom. All of this will bring us together. All of this will bring us great good in a life and in a time that has no moral compass. We live in an age which is among the most knowledgeable of all ages and yet the most ignorant. It is a time of great light. It is a time of great darkness. And it's got to have a moral compass. It's got to know the way to go forward. Otherwise, it will destroy itself. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Walillahi alhamd. قال الله تعالى في شأن حبيبه المصطفى الكريم صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وآله وأصحابه وأزواجه وذرياته وأهل بيته الطيبين ومحبيه ومحباته جميعا وجميع أمته من أولها إلى آخرها إلى يوم الدين اللهم بك نستعين فأعنا اللهم بك نستغيث فأغثنا اللهم عليك توكلنا فكفنا يا كافكفنا المهمات من أمر الدنيا والآخرة We ask God, we ask Allah by the blessings of these great days and by the blessings of the pilgrimage and these ancient signs of this great faith that he deliver the people of Syria from genocide. This is not a civil war in, in, in Syria. Look how the press kills people, innocent people. This is a war of genocide by a sectarian regime that cares nothing about human life. We ask Allah to deliver the Syrian people, to bless the Syrian people, to preserve the unity of that land, to restore the integrity of that civilization. These are a great people. We ask Allah to protect them. No one comes to their aid. They have no support. No one stands behind them. We ask Allah to stand behind them and to support them by the greatness of that land, the greatness of its people, and, and the heaven, heaviness of the, of the suffering that they have gone through. We ask Allah also to deliver the Muslims of Burma, who are also undergoing genocide. How much genocide have Muslims seen in the last 200 years and before that as well? Millions of people. Millions of people. And yet when the blood of Muslims is not mixed with oil, it has no value whatsoever. No one cries for us. No one cares for us. So we ask Allah Azza wa Jal that we care for each other. And that we defend each other. And that we pray for each other. And that Allah enables this great Ummah to come back to life and to be the civilization that it has been for over a thousand years. We are the builders of civilization. We have the keys to civilization. This is what we want to talk about on November the 10th. We hope you'll come to that event that uh, Afan told you about earlier. That how do we use knowledge to build civilization, to unleash the power of civilization? Allahumma a'izz al-Islam wa al-Muslimin wa a'ali bi fadlika kalimat al-haq wa al-din. Allahumma ansur man nasara hadhi al-din wa aqma' al-bid'a wa al-mubtadi'in. Allahumma taqabbal minna. Allahumma taqabbal minna. Allahumma taqabbal minna. Uh, thank you very much. May Allah bless you all, protect you all, give you health, bless your families, bless your neighbors. May each of us be a light that walks among humankind. May each of us be an emissary who takes this message with great wisdom to all the people around us. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.